Well, no one has ever clapped bef before when I came on a <laughs> came onto a podium. Well, thank you very much for being here. I mean, the attendance was tremendous. I had assumed I'll be speaking to a room of, s of six people, given the weather is more appropriate for staying at home and having hot chocolate with marshmallows than driving in the rain for some financial knowledge. Okay, so before I start sp talking specifically about the housing market itself, I will just let me just introduce myself to you and give you a little bit of an idea what kind of an economist is. Depending upon the areas of specialization, different economists do different types of work. I am what would be what would one would call a microeconomist, so I focus on choices made by individuals and families given what's happening in the economy around them. So I, for example, it's not really my job to make a judgment call or analyze whether Dr. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke did the right thing by increasing money supply to stimulate the economy. That's what a macroeconomist does. My job is to see, given that you have more money in the economy now, how do individuals adjust their daily choices and so that they can still maintain the standard of living. So this is how we'll go, go about this talk. It's just like five, six minutes of your time. <laughs> um, I will we'll first talk very briefly about the recent history about the housing market, um, what households had to do or families had to do with it. And then we'll go on to look at some factors that are specific to individuals that affect the cost of home ownership. I mean, you, you'll have everybody here uh, talking more about the specifics, but I will talk about the general issues that you would sit at a dinner table and talk about it at home and what kind of things you should be paying attention to. And then I will talk about the economic policies that's beyond your control, but that still will impact the total cost of home ownership over the entire period of uh, that you keep paying mortgages, etc. Okay. So let's look at it. OK, hold on. Just give me one second. Uh, OK. So beginning 2001, 2, 3, houses, uh, housing prices started rising. Um, in 2006, it reached its peak level. To give you an estimate of how big this rise was, between 1997 and 2006, housing prices rose up to 124% within a span of like nine years. Okay? And then it started falling. As Standard & Poor's have a housing price index, typically known as Case-Shiller Home Price Index. This, is b this has been built by two economists, Carl Case's Wesleyan University of Wellesley and um, Robert Schiller at Yale. They designed it. This is the aggregate pricing measure that people f who study urban economics or housing policies tend to look at to get a general essence of the health of the economy and the housing market. And this is not very region specific, it's national. Okay, so it, gi it shows that, so as you can see, it reached historical lows on December 30th, 2008. I looked at the value this morning, it's still pretty low. But again, that's national information. And there's a lot of variation across, in, across housing markets. In fact, Declan sent me some numbers that things look a little good, better. For Massachusetts itself, the sales have gone up over the last year or so. Is that the case? Yes. So again, it, um, I'm glad it's had fake numbers. Really <laughs> bad. <laughs> so what actually caused a crisis this big? There are many causes. Some of the commonly cited um, ones that are related to households are, it actually c connects directly with what people refer to as a critical part of the American dream, home ownership. There's nothing inherently wrong with having a dream of owning a home. But what happened in this case when borrowing markets were, bo like borrowing became very easy in the market, money went, on, went to hands of people who were not in the best position to pay it back. As that happened, it's not that everyone, everybody borrowing the, that money was, not in, was in a bad position. A good, unfortunately, a good chunk of them were. Okay? But as they kept borrowing money to buy new homes or expand their home sizes, that shot up the home demand, increasing home prices, where it reached 
at the peak in 2006, and then it started dropping. Okay? So subprime mortgages, that's talked about, and the other, uh, as a prime cause of the crash, government mandated loans. That like things that's happening through Fannie Mae, etc. But what happens from an individual perspective, what matters, the market crash, the value of your home went down, whatever the cause might have been. So that's, that's the critical part. Um, now, I just want to quickly distinguish between this, the, la the last point, difference between a market-related effect and a government policy-related effect. Both things can actually either hurt or improve the value of the home that you currently own. This, there's a slight difference. When the market operates, we don't get the information about how it operates at the very instant it's happening. So for example, right now, all of you are sitting in the room, a number of things are happening all around you, all around us, that's probably affecting our retirement accounts. We just don't know. We will get to know when we look at this next statement. So it ha there is a lag period. In case of a government policy, typically the information travels to, th to the public much faster through media. So if President Obama wants to do something about the housing market right now, or the, for example, um, he will make an announcement, the White House will make an announcement, and that will get printed. It doesn't mean everybody will know exactly how that's going to affect the individual, but at least the policy becomes known almost instantly. It's designed, and the government is ready to implement it. So that's a diff that, that these are two things that you, we need to pay attention to. So the cost of home ownership, and this is something you guys, all, um, I'm sure you all are quite aware of. The co cost of home ownership is not necessarily simply the mortgage you are pay paying or the in rate of interest. The house is typically the biggest thing that the individual purchases. Okay, so the first point we look at is the opportunity cost of home ownership. Every dollar you put invest in the house is a dollar taken away from something else, maybe savings for the kids, college saving, maybe student loan, health, retirement, something else. So that is not something you estimate or we are not visible. And that is specific to each, to each of you. Your financial advisor cannot really tell you directly how much you value that extra dollar going into your house. You, so can you, plan, can you plan for 10 years ahead? No, too many things. You'll have two different presidents over the next 10 years. Maybe two different human beings, probably. Okay, but it's re you can ha you may have when you sit down at home and talk about these things. You ha you can envision what are the things that will affect you over the next four or five years. Do you have a major financial commitment coming up? So something like that. It is not a very it's not a liquid liquid asset. So when you want to sell a part of uh, your asset to acquire some other thing, a house is the last thing you'll typically be selling. Okay, that means the conditions are pretty bad. Okay, and I hope not th that doesn't happen. The third point is, if problems arise not because people are, and often, I mean I should not generalize, but often problems arise in the housing market related to consumers. It's not because they decide to have a home. Uh, it's more about the amount of housing they want to consume. So for example, if you have an extra room, you're paying, you're making a down payment for the extra room along with the rest of the house, and you're paying interest with your mortgage payment over the course of next several years, okay? That extra room, it depends on how much you're going to use it. It might allow you to have a grand piano instead of an upright piano, but it doesn't guarantee you'll be a better pianist. So how, how many of you are look at things like Food Network, those wonderful shows, the cooking shows and things like that? They have these amazing kitchen, and I enjoy cooking. And, but it doesn't mean if I have a kitchen the size of Paula Deen, my pies will be as nice as hers. <laughs> <laughs> so so of, oftentimes, it's not about the house itself. There's nothing wrong in having the dream of owning my own home. But there's something a little tight about like, what do you do in a tough situation? How do you move the money out and invest in something, put it in something else? Okay? So these are the individual issues. This is not related to government choices. This is related to individual choices and n knowing your own cho situation as best as you possibly could in an environment. No financial advisor can really know about your aspirations, etc., better than you yourself do. So it's very clear that you know that up front. 
Now this is the last slide. These are the typical government-related policies. See, these are not direct housing market policies. But the housing market is very intricately linked with numerous other markets. So I have put just three on, on the slide, so you get a sense of how these policies might affect your cost of home ownership. Currently, so the, money, the monetary policy. Currently, uh, under, under Ben Bernanke, they are actually pursuing a strategy of maintaining low interest rate. That is good because your interest payments are likely to be low. Two things to keep in mind. Ben Bernanke's term gets over on, in January 2014. We don't know if, he's going to, if it's going to be renewed or we have a new chairman. But given the current economic condition, this is how you would read the economic information to your own use. Right now, the US needs rapid investment. So it's in the best strategy of the country to keep interest rates low enough to mobilize economic activity through investment domestically. So we can expect low interest rate for the next few years, if not next 15 years. Okay? So that's a positive thing that might affect your cost of ownership. Tax policies. The critical question at this point, and that both parties are holding off till the elections, is expiration of the Bush tax cuts. Okay? So what's going to happen if they automatically expire? We go back to the Clinton era income tax rates. Okay? No, no party, doesn't matter who becomes president, is going to try higher rates because that will be suicidal for 2016. The highest rates you can expect, at least over the next four or five years, are the Clinton era tax rates. Okay? But things are slightly different now than it was 15 years ago. 15 years ago, with due respect, you were 15 years younger. Different tax, tax brackets, diff possibly different income rates, different tax brackets. So a good thing now would be, so if, if I had to face this question, next time I do my taxes or meet the tax guy helping me to do the taxes, talk it over at my current income rate, <laughs> income level. If the in Clinton era tax rates are actually imposed on me, how well do I do with the current house? Do I, do I should, should I be refinancing it? Do I, do I need to cut corners? I hope none of you have to do that. But in the event that something like that happens, you should at least know what corners you're willing to cut without go, going for a drastic change to lifestyle. Okay? This is the, in this particular case, usually it's hard to predict tax policies up front. But in this pol case, you're in good shape to predict because they're not going to go to a rate above the Clinton era tax cuts. And the country has already spent eight years, or what, seven years with the Clinton era tax cuts, the Clinton era tax rates. So you can calculate it. So you will get to know the situation that's going to affect you now if the tax cuts expire, the Bush tax cuts expire, okay? The third policy, it's a little difficult to see how a trade policy can directly affect households, but it can. So for example, I'm not trying to pick on any po individual political party, but in this case, if you have been following the news lately, Governor Romney had made the statement that we need a more aggressive policy against China, okay? to bring the jobs back. Honestly, even his best friend know, if elected, he would think several times before actually going for it. Okay? But suppose he did something like that. Suppose things turn out, he can, becomes president and something like that. How do you expect you yourself to be affected by it? Well, f the first thing is, China is a very important country in this case. It holds 26% of total U.S. Treasury securities, which is 8% of total U.S. public debt. One country, there are over 200 countries in the world, one single country holds 8% of your debt. That's a huge level, okay? Now, in general, it would not be advisable for China to dump these treasuries in the world market. And they will think several times. But in the worst case scenario, they can re retaliate. And I was thinking, what would be one of the most strongest way of retaliating to an aggressive US trade policy? And that seemed most likely to me. Okay, so that can affect us in two ways. The first is, how does it affect my portfolio? That's very hard to predict, provide. It is again specific to each of you. How much of your portfolio or 401k, whatever it is, currently invested in emerging markets? How much of it's invested in companies or, uh, or index funds that have companies in them? 
um, tied to China in some way or the other. But to be somewhat aware of this possibility. This is, I'm telling you, the worst case scenario. This won't happen. Because I think both parties would like to target for 2016. I really don't think they'll have that aggressive a policy. And also, production processes take time to transfer from one location to another. It is not that you have an aggressive trade policy over China, India, or anywhere in the world, and next day you have jobs in the United States. Okay? You have to rebuild from scratch. So it'll take time. The other thing is, if they were to dump US Treasury securities in the world market, that would lead to a drop in the val value of dollar, making the current foreign goods available in the country. And you have a lot of it. I mean, if you look, go through the labels in Je Jesse Penny or Macy, pretty much every other thing comes from China. <laughs> OK? I mean, you would be so surprised. I'm an Indian. Even Indian markets are flooded with Chinese goods. Even things something like pencils. And we wonder, I mean, India is not capable of producing pencils. We have the cheapest possible labor you can think of. We still can't produce our own pencils. Okay? But, so, but it's very difficult to anticipate this effect, these effects up front. But it's a but so what do, what do we do? We don't do nothing about it? Well, when we read newspapers, watch television, pay a little more attention to the information that's coming to you through it. So when the time comes, I, I don't expect all of you to go home and make a major housing market related decision, like buy a new home or refinance it overnight. No, but when the time comes to have these conversations at home, you bring good quality information so that you can make well informed decisions for yourself. So now that I've told you all this, it's costing you 10 minutes of your life. Um, what would I do if I had a million dollar tonight? Would I, would I buy, go out and buy a house tomorrow? I would wait for the next president to come in and to see what his economic plan is. The new president, I mean, it's easy when you're on a campaign trail to make statements to attract votes. Once you're in the White House, you actually have to have a concrete plan, even if the plan might not work. But you still have to have a plan. So the best thing I would do in, in this case, wait for the next four or five months to see what the new plan would look like and get a sense of how the total cost of home ownership would affect us over the next 10, 15 years. Now, having said all this, I should say it's not very easy to read economic information. For example, just to give an example, in 2005, Alan Greenspan was the head of, uh, or the chairman of Federal Reserve Bank. So when he received information that things don't look all right in the housing market, he stated, we have a little froth in the market. It was not a lit little froth. In two years' time, he realized it was a big bubble. And then he made another statement. It was just many little froths that got together and made the bubble. It's not that he was trying to cheat the public or do anything. He, he was doing his job. It's, it's just, and the same thing happens in 1998 with the, the derivatives, market for derivatives. They, even the best economist who has a good sense of it can make wrong choices because they are not able to read the market correctly. That's the, that's the complex, complexity of the markets. Okay? So what do we do? We just do the best we can and try to use the information to our advantage. That's all any of us can do. That's all. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Great. Um, well, my, my introduce me. My name is Jen Harvey, and I work locally um, with a great brokerage and a great team. And I've been doing it 10 years, and now five years on my own with, um, again, a great group of associates. Um, yes, in 2006, we had a slight shift in the market. Here in Berkshire County, we actually didn't really feel it until 2008. Um, there was not a huge decline in housing prices and sales until around 2008. We all sort of adjusted to what was going on. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the um, appraisals and adjusted around in 2009 and assessed values have now, I don't know, most of you probably recognize your assessed values are coming in around the same price as what your house is probably worth now. Whereas about in 2005, 2006, you'd see the assessed values were half of what your market value was. Um, so now you can sort of look up your tax card 
and kind of guess that that might be about what your house is worth. Um, typically, that's what we've noticed in the current market. Um, and as Maya said, yes, very differently per county. Um, North County, Central County, and South County are extremely different markets. As you can imagine, Pittsfield is just a constantly moving market. It's a different price point, but it moves all the time, every day. When I go into the office every morning, we pull up what's called the hot sheet, and it tells us what's currently on the market today that just came on in the last time I checked the hot sheet, so typically the day before, and what's put under contract and what's um, sold. And Pittsfield is always there. I mean, anywhere from five listings in a day to you know 20 they would have pending or under contract. And I'm mainly going to focus on residential. I'm not going to touch on multifamilies, condos, or land. Um, but to give you an idea, land sales are down 67% this year from last year. Um, directly, you know, they are directly affected by the cost of building, which is not at all changed. Um, if anything, materials have gone up in price because of the state of the economy. Things like copper and sheetrock and plywood are ex very expensive. They have not come down to meet. So you see a lot of land um, out there that's still available. And actually, it hasn't even really come down. Um, so I, we don't know. There's no formula for that um, unless it's developable, unless people can come in and put in a subdivision and have the means to do that. Um, but right now, in Berkshire County, there are almost 1,400 houses for sale, just residents, um, which is an extremely <laughs> Yeah, it's a, lot, it's a lot of houses. But so far this year, 676 of them have sold. Not of that 1,300, but 676 houses have sold this year so far, which is really good. The average days on market right now is around 187 days that a, a residential home will sit on the market. You know, last year, I have to cheat and look at my notes. Um, okay. Last year, that was 263 days. You know, the year before that, it was 260 days, or actually 289 days. 2009, it was 260 days. Before that, it was 256 days. Um, so it's in 2008 would have been um, where we hit it. And it was still only 256 days was the average days on market. And 910 houses sold in 2008 in Berkshire County, um, which is still really good. I mean, we did drop 100 homes from 2008 to 2009, selling only 810, and then increased again in 2010 to 870. Um, last year was 884, and again, we're at 676, and we still have one of our strongest selling seasons ahead of us, but as we, you know, as we know, during the um, election year, typically, you know, we do see adjustments in what our averages are. Spring and fall, yes? Uh, I just want to ask a quick question. That's sure. What was the longest, the longest period that the houses were on? No it, averages. Um, yeah, av we, uh, for this year? 1,300 days. What about last? Last year, um, the average days on market for like the longest, I don't think I print, I don't think I have that. I'm, I, I'm sorry, but this year I have one. It's 1,397 days it's been on the market. Um, I'm not sure the strategy behind that. Typically what we do, if I have a listing, we tend to go for like a 12-year, I mean a 12-month contract because it cuts down on paperwork. You can withdraw at any time. That from that contract, and you don't owe a month, you don't owe anybody any money. And if you relist with another agency right away, there's not even a protection period. Typically, if you withdraw and you want to, um, you know, wait out a season, we we tend to put in a protection period of 90 days. It says if a buyer we've shown your property to, over the next 90 days, comes back and wants to buy your house, you might entertain us allowing to sell it again, and we would then, you know, engage in that contract again. Um, Nowadays, you know, people list for maybe six months to 12 months, and they go a season, and then we, you know, kind of reassess. I mean, during the whole time, we're in communication because we do open houses, and of course there are showings, and we communicate a lot with our sellers. And I will say the communication with sellers and the relationship with sellers has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> it's sort of become more of a, I feel like a psychologist at times. I feel like I'm, I'm you know, kind of, really working with people and, and trying to teach them. You know, for a while we were teaching buyers, you know, this is what you do when you're purchasing a home, this are what the things you learn about, you know, getting financing, having a home inspection, all the things that you need to know to feel equipped to move forward with a purchase. Now we educate, over the last three years, we've been educating sellers with 
the economy. Because so-and-so down the street sold their house for such and such amount of money two years ago or last year. And you try to say, well, gosh, in six months the market changes. You know, I'm very happy for so-and-so down the street and I, you know, I'm aware of their house and what it sold for, but this is now and this is today and this is what your house is worth. Um, and sometimes it's a harsh reality because in the years that we've had, these last four years, it, it is a huge change in price. It could be anywhere from a house selling for a million dollars and now it might be worth $600,000. So it's um, a huge shift and people are still not adjusted, which is why you still see 1,397 days. I mean, a smart person would just say, I'm going to take a season off. You know my house is available to sell. You could sell it if you want, you know, and we can engage in a contract again. But I'd rather start a new season with a fresh number so it doesn't seem like there's something terribly wrong with my house. Because usually that's what you think. I mean, anytime I go, I mean, I occupational hazard, we go on vacation. And because of her, we have been looking at houses everywhere we travel. Like, we just do. We just can't help it. We go to open houses. We just do it. Like, it's just something we love to do. And, you know, when a house has been on the market a long time, the first thing you think is something's wrong with it. Even I think that, even though I could, if there might not be anything wrong with it, it's just that someone left it on the market that long because they're poorly advised or that's just the way they feel. Um, so we try to shorten those times. Um, and we always laugh when we go to get a listing. I have a really fabulous business partner and we enjoy very much going together to get listings because we work very well together. And, you know, um, there's always an argument over, you know, what, what we make. You know, what's my commission? And um, is there any negotiating room in that? And a realtor, when I first got in the business, she worked with me for a bit. And we would talk about that, you know, I said, because I'd be so nervous going to my first listing appointment. You know, I just wanted to give it away. Yes, I'll do whatever you want me to do just so I can get the listing. I'll take whatever percentage you're willing to pay me. And she said to me, she goes, well, if you think about it, she goes, when they, next time they ask you, you know, when you say we get 6% and they say, well, would you do it for less? And you, she says, well, what of all the things I'm willing to offer you are you willing to live without? Would you like me not to put you in the home buyer's guide? Would you like me not to advertise you on our website? Would you like me not to, you know, show your house endlessly, tirelessly, retake your photographs? You know, and we go through all the lists and it was, it was a very good point that she made. I have yet to say that to any of my <laughs> listing appointments, but I always think of it whenever they ask me. I'm always like, it's true. Like, what am I, what are you willing to give up that I offer? Um, and something we always say when we get to a listing, you know, what are you going to do differently? You know, I've had my house listed for a year with someone else. What are you going to offer me? We do um, have a very basic template for what we do. You know, there's the home buyer's guide. Now there's the new Berkshire real estate guide that you've all seen. Um, those, I will tell you, are for the seller. They're not for a buyer. A buyer grabs it at Guido's or grabs it wherever they grab it, and then they go home and they go on the internet. And that's where they spend most of their time shopping for a house. The Paper publications are really just for sellers to be like, oh, I'm in the home buyer's guide. You know, I'm th there's my house and so people will see it. But then they go online because we don't have, you, we have this tiny space to work with in the home buyer's guide. We don't have a lot of control over the quality of, you know, the print. So we, you know, do a very basic showing of all of our listings. And then people go onto the web and that's where they do all our searching and that's where they can see all the beautiful pictures. And um, what we stress to people is all we have to work with are pictures and words. So when you look at other listings and people ask us, well, why are the pictures so bad? And all I can say is, I don't know. You know, I don't know why the pictures are so bad or I don't know why, you know, they didn't. We, I will, cl I've cleaned houses to take the photos of the houses because, you know, that's all I have. And we have two days to, from when you sign a contract to list your property with me. I have two days to get it into the system, to get it on the hot sheet, to get it on our website so that everybody sees it for the first time. And it, we want it to be perfect. Like, we want it to look how it can look at its best so that when people come across it, they know your house. You know, they can see it and they're not like, you know, it might come up because you might have a price point from 400,000 to 600,000 and you'll have 75 houses to look at in your just in South County to look at in that price point. And so when you're online searching through them, you're going to bypass the ones that have one photograph. You're going to say, oh, maybe I'll drive by it or, you know, maybe I'll look at it later or I, it's not going to be in the final list yet or the ones that have blurry photographs or crooked or don't say anything in the copy or, you know, it's just funny. Just like when you're searching for a rental on VRBO, you're like, oh, there's no photographs? Like, I'm not going to look at that house. Or, um, that's, you know, all we have to work with to market. I mean, that's, so we take very much pride in our photographs and our copy. Yes? Will you tell us a little bit what you were about to get into, which is comparing the North, Mid, mm -hmm. and South County and mm -hmm. 
Well, North County, I don't know if everybody knows what North County is, but North County is like Williamstown, Dalton, Hancock, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, not Dalton. Um, Savoy, Florida, North Adams, Clarksburg, and Adams. And right now, there are 175 houses on the market in North County. And I'm just doing, this is just a second quarter for this year, so 2012. So second, this is still including first quarter as far as active listings. And the average days on market for this quarter have been 236 days. And the average price for a house is 414,000. That's list price right now. Um, sold so far this year have been 86 houses. Um, the average list price, or the average sale price was 181,000 and the average days on market is 162 days. Um, right now there are 96 houses under contract and that average price right now is $223,000. Um, and that sort of sums up North County. And it's only, it's only six ta seven towns, so it's not a very large, you know, when you think about North County, too, it's a lot of land. I mean, there's a lot of open land. There's not a lot of residential. Williamstown is, is probably what would, is probably what's causing it to be 414,000 being the average list price. Because there are, mul you know, there are multi-million dollar properties for sale in Williamstown. But then, of course, you've got to consider, it, like, you know, I look at the hot sheet all the time and I'm like, Adams, you know, you'll see, or North Adams, you'll see this, like, really great house. And it'll be $60,000. And I think, why don't I want to live in Adams? Like, why can't I just commute? Like, that would be paid for. I would, you know, not have the mortgage I have. But, you know, that's, again, the market that you're in. And then, you know, Central County is a large chunk, and Pittsfield is a huge chunk of that. Like, right now, there are 334 houses for sale in um, Pittsfield, and the average price is 366000 They have sold 194 houses so far this year, or this quarter, excuse me, second quarter. And right now, there are 206 under contract. And this second quarter is only from, you know, June. This is, so this is only July, August, you know, it's half of September. Um, so it's, that's a lot of houses. I mean, 206 right now to be under contract is a lot. And the average price is $212,000. And this doesn't even touch on multifamilies because Pittsfield is known for uh, multifamilies. They go through a lot and they uh, change hands a lot. Um, but the average days on market of those 206 houses that are under contract is 257 days. So it's still higher than the overall average, um, which is 187 days right now. And then in South County, there are 563 houses on the market right now. This is from June on. Um, average days on market is 288 days, and the average asking price is $690,000. Um, we have sold 143 houses in South County so far from June on, and the average sale price is $349,000, and the average days on market, 256. There are 179 under contract right now in South County. Yes? One is the average list price, and one is the average sold price. And then one is under contract, the average. So I'm taking, do you want me to say them again? So the average list price is dollars And $90,000 is the average list price of those 563 houses that are currently on the market in South County. And the average sold is 300 Yes. So basically you're saying the, the lower price houses are the ones you're selling? The lower, anything under 400000 I will take any day of the week. They bring, they bring us through every economy. They are our bread and butter. Um, they move if they're priced well. I mean, I, to be down to 187 days on market right now is awesome. You know, it, we were telling people 18 months seemed to be the average time from list to sell. You know, list to close, it seemed to be last year and the year before. Even though, you know, statistics are still in the 250, 260 range for those years, it felt, you know, again, those are just averages. I mean, it felt like a lot of them, we, we were, wor I mean, you probably pick up a home buyer's guide and you're like, that house is still on the market? And like, what did it start at? It started at, you know, we have a house listed right now. It started at $3.4 million, and it's now at $1,295,000. It's, um, it's, it's crazy. And so the things like that skew the market incredibly. So we try to go for medians, but right now what the statistics are drawing are averages. Like, I prefer medians. Obviously, they're more accurate because they knock out the crazy high-end ones and, and give you an actual number that you can work with. Unfortunately, the way that our MLS works right now, it's averages. So I, those $5 million and those you know, $25,000 sales are adjusting the price point. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Can you just run through the central? Or yeah, central. Yep. Um, so right now, this is as of June, the second quarter, 334 houses are on the market. 
and the average list price is 366000 214 and sold is 194 and that average sale price is 181876 this is center, Central County. So this is, you know, Pittsfield, Richmond is included, Hancock, Lanesboro, Washington, Middlefield, Peru, Hinsdale, Dalton, and Windsor, and Cheshire. So that's a large chunk. Um, and the average days on market of those sold was 184. And there are now 206 houses under contract. And that average under contract price is 212,000. And that average days on market is 257. I can make them available. Great. Yeah, I can email you. This all comes in PDF. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then, yes? Is that useful information to put in a bid? No. <laughs> Not really. No, as you know, a buying a house is an emotional thing, unless you're an investor, but typically it's an emotional buy. So some people are willing to pay. I mean, we've, we've had bidding wars even now, and people are paying. Like, I just put a house under contract last week where two people were great candidates. They both were pre-qualified. They, you know, really great people and the seller had a huge decision for him because they both came in with the same price over asking so it's you know unfortunately they were the ones that they had listed it about six years ago for almost six hundred thousand and now it's being offered at two hundred and forty nine thousand so it's just yeah. you know it, it it's it's unfortunate when you're behind the market like when you come in behind the market Sure. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, and it's been very successful, and you know, why not let people back to the center of market? Yeah, yeah. It's called real data. It's not online. Could you tell me what your realtor, what realtor are you with? Um, I own Berkshire Property Agents. It's called my own. Nope. <laughs> no, nope. I own uh, Berkshire Property Agents. It's on Railroad Street in Great Barrington. I didn't want to plug it, though. numbers, mm -hmm. but with your expertise and that you're totally in the field all the time, can you give us a little sense of the insight into the culture and what, what's driving the markets and, the, and what, what the, the, the pulse is in each of these different areas? Well, I will tell you that um, Central County tends to be, you know, it's, um, it's first time home buyers or it's people downsizing that, you know, the sales are working very much in a community that stays within that community. They don't have a lot of, sec there aren't a lot of second homeowners necessarily in Central County. North County ha tends to have a little bit more um, than, than Central County. South County is, it, it could be 50-50 sometimes, I feel like, it, you know, where you're working with second homeowners and full-time residents. Um, a lot of communities, and I concentrate mostly in South County, so I apologize that I don't, you know, necessarily have a, a hands-on idea of North County because I just, it wouldn't be fair for me to try to market North County because I don't know it and it's just too far. I can just give you statistical reports on it and we've definitely, actually we have some listings up in Williamstown that are, which are beautiful but we co-list them with other realtors up there so that, you know, if someone happens to see it on our site because we get a lot of hits on our site, people will come onto our site and see it and then want to go up there and look at it. But, um, for South County specifically, and this works the same for all counties, as you guys know, each town is different. The tax rate, the mill rate is different for every town, and some actually separate commercial tax um, mill rates from residential mill rates. Most of South County, it's the same, because there isn't a lot of commercial, like out in New Marlboro, you're not going to have a different mill rate for What's commercial. A mill rate? a mill rate is your tax base. So uh, Great Barrington is $12.13 is their mill rate per thousand of your assessed value. Because Great Barrington offers things like public sewer, public schools, public water, police department, fire department. You get to Alford and it's $4. They don't have a public school. They don't have a police department. The fire department's volunteer. The state police are the ones that patrol Alford. Hancock is the lowest in the, in the county. Theirs is like, I think, just under $4 because they don't offer a lot of municipalities. 
but it can it can vary. And then you jump into Lee, and Lee's around uh, same thing, thirteen dollars. But Sheffield is also thirteen dollars, and they don't offer public sewer. They have some public water on some of the main streets, but they don't offer a lot of it. And Pittsfield is low too. Pittsfield separates their commercial from their residential because they're. Um, there's a great number of commercial residents, but or commercial spaces. Um, but theirs is around fourteen dollars, which isn't terrible because you're that's including, you know, like sewer and water and schooling and public some public transportation. Um, and I think your trash might be included in that too. Um, I know in Richmond it's included in it. So Center County has a little bit more um, municipal. M I L L. Really? Yeah. Why is that the name? Mill rate? I don't, I don't know. Okay. I never researched that. Yeah. Um, um, what else was I going to say? Uh, yeah, so do you have like uh, one or two other like highlights that you really wanted to say and then what we can do is go to mortgages um, and then we can, then we'll come back to Q&A and just, you know, maybe mark down your questions or say, unless somebody has a really hot question right now for Jen, just right before. Well, um, right now, um, sales are up in Berkshire County. We're up um, across the county. What is the average? 16% from last year. South County alone is only 7% up, um, but North County is 30%, and Central County is 17% up from last year, which is great. Um, the only thing that's suffering is South County land. It's down 67%, but it's up everywhere else. Land is up in you know uh, Central County 150%. So I'm assuming that there might have been you know, a bunch of purchases made in this last quarter or the beginning of the quarter. Um, and then land is up 350% in North County. And some of that, I will tell you, has to do with solar and wind power, because people are now coming to the quieter areas of North County, realizing they've got huge exposure south facing, purchasing it because right now the, um, the uh, towns don't have a policy yet in place. So they're able to these, you know, developers or, you know, energy, people are able to come in now to help the town develop their energy policy and therefore allow for solar farms to go in or wind farms to go in. Whereas um, South County has developed um, a stricter policy right now with solar farms and wind farms. So um, I think that's also one of the reasons that, because I work with a couple of buyers that are in that, that field that cannot buy in South County. So they, we definitely do a lot of you know, driving north um, for land as far as that goes. Um, what else? short little blurb to say about how you compare this region with the, what you hear going nationally? Well, um, I mean, maybe I'm asking you something. No, 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 it's okay. I, 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 I feel really lucky to own real estate in Berkshire County. Um, you know, we sort of, the Berkshires was put on the map, you know, by the Gilded Age, you know, the people, wealthy families moved here and built the cottages, <laughs> 17,000 square feet of them. And, um, you know, sort of put the Berkshires on the map. And that is, we've st we're still drawing on that. Like, we are a cultural center for being in the middle of the hill, you know, for being where we are, two and a half hours from Boston, two and a half hours from Manhattan, without any public transportation. We are really lucky that we're able to sustain the economy the way we have. Um, I think that, you know, with the drop in prices and with the way things are going, it's helped a lot of um, local families be able to afford to buy houses. And that makes me so happy when people can afford to, when my friends who are buying houses can afford to buy houses in my, you know, in the towns we grew up in. And, you know, just like everything else, there's a cycle and we need the cycle. Um, because when, when, before the economy really crashed, like before we felt it in 2008, there were almost 800 realtors in Berkshire County. And um, because everybody thought, oh, I'll just become a realtor. It's so easy. It's not easy. It is 24-7. You get called on. It doesn't matter where you are. You get called no matter where you are. And, you know, you're accountable, especially owning it. I'm, I'm accountable for everything. Now there are, I think, 520 realtors, which is, seems to be the average of what we have in the, in the um, county over, the, like, the decade I've worked. Um, but it, did, it got to an astronomical amount of people. Um, so again, that cycle helps purge out people that really don't know what they're doing. You know, just like, um, I forgot the first speaker's name, I'm Zinnia. sorry, Zinnia. Just like Zinnia said, like, y you know, just like with anything, you have to get, make informed decisions. So you have to go to, you know, just like I 
definitely nepotism. I send a lot of people to my mother because I trust her. She does. She's you know she helped me through my mortgage process, and um, she's been doing it over 30 years. And I can call her and refer to her and send people to her and be like, I, you know, I don't even know. What, and it's, I was telling her on the way yesterday. I was like, Mom, I you know. No, it was this afternoon. I was like, I don't even know what a point is. Tell people what a point, like start very the basics, you know, and tell them exactly what it is. Because, you know, when I'm going to sell a house and people are like, what is a Title V? You know, you take for granted the things that you in the field every day get used to and the terminology you get used to. And other people are like, what are you talking about? Um, so it's nice to start at a very basic level and move forward and help, um, help people. Uh, I'll wait for questions after. That's good. That's, that's great. So that's Oh, five minutes is good. <laughs> I'm not such eloquent speakers as everybody else. I mean, they've done, s and I'm feeling real guilty. I need a kitchen, and I'm <laughs> debating whether to go for it now, but I need it. Um, my name's Lou Ann Harvey, and I've been doing mortgage banking for over 30 years, um, working at several banks in the area. Um, what I thought I would do is take you through the process. Looking around, I think everybody really knows the process, but I'll just go through it you know, with you anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about land loans. I'm not going to talk about construction loans, but all banks have them. Um, you know, land loans, as Jen said, they're, uh, well, she didn't talk about the loans, but she said land values are down. We only lend up to 65% of the sale price of land because they are a risky loan. So anyway, what normally we do is we, they educate people to come to the bank to try to get what they call pre-qualified or pre-approved. You come to the bank, you bring your criteria, your, your pay stubs, your tax returns, um, and we sit down and we kind of calculate how much you can afford for a house. I take your multi-payments, I take what your multi-payments would be on your new existing ho your new home, and I calculate the ratios, that's how banks do it. We pull your credit so we know that you're credit worthy, because we don't want you going out looking at houses if, if you have spotty credit. Um, we do all that at a prequal, and then at the prequal, what we do is we give you a letter. There's a difference between a prequalification letter and a pre-approval letter. Most banks like to do what they call prequalification letters. It's a little bit, it's not really worth the paper it's written on, but the brokers seem to like it, and the other people <laughs> seem to like it, so we let it go. Anyway, so what we do with that is we type up a letter. Um, we say they've been pre-qualified for up to a certain amount of money. Um, what they do with it is another thing because it's very hard for them to take that piece of paper and go to the broker's office and say, well, we're pre-approved for X amount of dollars. Because then the broker knows and they're negotiating what they can go up to when they're negotiating. So I always say, just tell them you've been pre-approved and um, don't show them, sorry. No, don't, show them, right. <laughs> don't show them the paper because that's your real bargaining thing and everything. So. Anyway, they go to the broker, they find a house, they know what they're qualified for, then they come back to me. At that point, then they bring all their financials. They bring their bank statements, their tax returns, their W-2s, their everything you can possibly think of we ask for. Um, and then again, we, once again, we go through the qualifications again. Um, they also bring the purchase and sales agreement. Um, we talk about different products. As you know, banks have a menu of different products, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. So when you do go to a bank, well, a bank or a, um, you know, a, a mortgage uh, broker, I tend to like banks better because I work for a bank, but if you go to, a, go to somebody who knows what they're doing, don't go to a customer service rep, go to a mortgage officer, because as I was saying before, there's a menu of products. We have FHA, we have VA, we have rural housing. We have Mass House, and we have Fannie. We have, we have just about every loan possible. And it's real important to know that you're getting the loan that suits your needs. There's adjustable versus fixed. Everybody that comes to me says, well, this is going to be the house I'm going to live in forever. Everybody says that. I'm going to live in here forever, so I want a fixed rate. You know, I see the same people within five years. They've come back. They're going to refinance, because now they're going to add on the upstairs, or they're going to put the garage on, or they're going to do something, or they want to consolidate their debt. A lot of people come back, and they've, they've built up some credit card debt or whatever, and they want to come and consolidate that. So we talk about which product would be better for them. I did a little scenario on a um, $200,000 mortgage. Right now, rates are down 
on like a five-year adjustable. A five-year adjustable is a 30-year term. It's locked in for the first five years because I just got done saying that most people keep their mortgages five years. So think about a five-year adjustable at 2.99 versus a 30-year fix. The current rates on those are excellent too, 3.625. The difference per month would be roughly, oh, I think I figured it out. Well, I, I did it over a year. Um, let me see here. It's no, $842 versus $912. So over the five-year period, you would be saving $4,200 if you went with the adjustable. But if you're like all my other customers, you're determined to get that fixed because you're going to be in there forever and you're never going to refinance it. Just think about your options. Some people will buy because they're buying on spec. They're thinking, you know what, I could probably flip this house in a few years. Why would you go with a fixed rate if you're going to do something like that? So just keep all your options open. I just want to make sure I went over that. There's also... Why would you go with a fixed? What is, what is the pros and cons of fixed versus adjustable? Well, a fix is good if you really are going to be there forever. <laughs> a fix is good if you are going to be in there for more than seven years, I would say, because the rates are at an all-time low. We've never seen rates at 3.625 before. That's fixed for 30 years. Um, a 15-year fix right now is 2.875. It's just unbelievable. But if you're, I'm sorry. Yeah, that doesn't always trickle down to all of us. The rates are different depending on what region, like New York City has different rates than we have. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know right now for a 15 year, I don't even, how many years is that? I'm not sure. Okay, I know right now the lowest we have is 2.875 for a 15 year. And that's pretty much the norm in the area. There's also another loan, we call it the portfolio loan. And the portfolio loan is extremely important, especially to local people. Local people like to know that their loan is, is sold, or not sold, it's kept here and serviced here. So we do have portfolio loans for people that are adamant about keeping their loans here. The drawback with a portfolio loan is that the rate is higher. The rate's higher because banks um, well, the rate's higher because it's a riskier loan. Banks don't like keeping fixed assets on their books. It just doesn't make sense. So what they do is they, we would look at 4.5 fixed versus 3.625 fixed. And that little margin is to help us with the, with the risk. Anyway, portfolio loans are good for people because we service them and we keep them. If you run into a problem down the road, five years you lose your job or whatever, and you have a portfolio with, our ba with the bank, we can do what we call modification agreement. Modification agreement means that we can change the terms of your existing mortgage. We can change it so it's interest only for maybe five months to, to ease the pain of a mortgage payment for you. If the rates come down drastically, we can reduce your rate to a certain amount for a small fee if it's with us, if it's a portfolio loan. Um, there's lots of good reasons for having a portfolio loan, but there's also lots of good reasons for having a Fannie Mae loan. Fannie Mae is our other fixed rate loans. You've heard somebody mention Fannie Mae earlier. Those are the very low fixed rates, the 30-year 3.625. All banks in the area, or most of the banks in the area, have what we call Fannie Mae loans, the 3.625. Most of the banks in the area sell those mortgages. The one thing they don't do, or most of them don't do, is they don't sell off the servicing. That's real important, because that means if you, a year down the road, have problems with your real estate taxes or something, you want to be able to call the bank and not an 800 number. You want to be able to talk with a bank and not deal with an 800 number. So anytime you see those low rates and you want a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or whatever, go for it. But just make sure that the bank itself retains the servicing. They can sell off the loan, who cares? But you want them to retain the servicing. So then you come in and we start with the loan application. We get all the information. Let me go over here. Um, we make sure you qualify. We did all the ratios. Ratios are how banks qualify you. What they do is they'll take your monthly principal and interest, your monthly real estate taxes, your monthly homeowner's insurance. Say that figure comes up to be $1,000. They divide that into what you call your gross monthly income. 
Now, for self-employed borrowers, and tell me if I'm talking too fast or, or whatever, for self-employed borrowers, we use net income. But for salaried employees, we use gross. So we take that $1,000, which represents your monthly housing expense, we divide it into your gross monthly income, OK? Say it's 4000 So we're at a ratio of 25%. We can go up to our first ratio, we can go up to 32%. So that works. The second ratio in how banks qualify you is they'll take that $1,000. Now we're going to add in your car payment. We're going to add in your monthly um, charge cards, your student loans, any other uh, monthly debt you have. We're going to add that up. So say now we're at 1500 and we still make the same 4000 We divide that, and we're still below the 41-42% debt ratio. That's the highest we'll go, is usually 41-42%. There are other programs, FHA and everything else, that will go higher, but banks tend to stay below 41%. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There's two ratios. There's a housing ratio, your monthly housing ratio, principal interest, taxes, and insurance. Take that, your monthly housing expense, divide it into your gross monthly income. That's 32%. The second ratio takes in your, your car loan, your student loans, all your other stuff, and you divide that into your, um, your gross monthly income. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Then what we do is when we figure out all the ratios and you qualify, we've got all the information we need, we order an appraisal. An appraisal is like so important nowadays. As you hear, the, the appraisals are, we're really having a tough time with the appraisals, to be honest with you, whether you're buying or whether you're refinancing. Right now, we'll, we'll concentrate on buying, and then I'll skip over to refinancing. Um, so we order the appraisal. the appraisal. The appraiser has to go out and find three comparable sales that have taken place within the last six months. Doesn't usually happen because he can't find comparable sales in this market and hasn't been able to in the last couple of years. So they usually stretch it to a year, and they usually go outside of their little area. Like if it's Great Barrington, they may go to uh, Sheffield or whatever. They have to find three comparable sales that have taken place and comp out the new purchase to that and come up with a value. Now, on a purchase, that's a little bit easier. Um, on a refinance, we're having major problems because people's value, unfortunately, has depreciated quite a bit. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've had people apply. She was talking about a $3.5 million house. I had somebody apply for a mortgage for 3.5 because their house was worth five. Well, their appraisal came in at like 2.7. So there's a lot of problems with appraisals right now and a lot of reasons why. It's a depressed market. The sales are down. The sale prices are down. There's things called short sales. I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but that's bringing the appraisals down because People are virtually walking away from their houses, giving the banks their key, asking, will you take less than what I owe? And banks have no choice to do that or to go to a foreclosure auction. So the short sales are bringing the appraisals down, too. It's, it's really a tough market. And we feel so bad because people come in and say, well, I know my house is worth 400 And I hate like hell to call them up and say, well, your appraisal came in and it's 225 You know, we can't give you what you want. But there is help. Well, it should be. Right. You're talking about the opposite. No, I'm talking about if we like to see an 80% loan to value, because then you don't have to have what they call mortgage insurance. Any time the value is greater than 80%, the value of your mortgage compared to what? The value of what you owe compared to uh, the value of the house. If it goes below or above 80%, you have to have mortgage insurance. Now, we, that's why we're having these problems. Most refinances we're OK with, but there are quite a few that we're not. Um, sales, we usually go back to the broker and say, look at, or the attorney, and say, look at, the value came in at x amount of dollars. You know, um, They can go back and renegotiate, or they can you know, put more money down. It's their choice. But on a refinance, if your loan to value, to answer your question, is greater than 80% on a refinance, and you don't have a choice there, there is a program that the government came out with, and it's called the HARP program. 
H-A-R-P. And what it does, if you have a loan with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, they will allow you to refinance even though your loan to value is greater than 80%. There's, you go on to Fannie Mae's website or Freddie Mac's website, you plug in your address and your name, and they'll tell you whether or not Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, if you have a loan with them. And they'll tell you banks in the area that are doing the HARP program. To be honest with you, my bank currently is not doing the HARP program, but there are other banks that are doing it. And what is it? What is the HARP program? It's allowing people to refinance even though they've lost equity in their house. They've lost so much equity. Their credit still has to be good, though. Um, you can't go, you have to have one year of good credit, and you have to be above the 80% loan to value. Right. The HARP will assist with that? I, I think they do away with it. They won't even include it. They don't even right. include PMI, Right. So that would be a very good interest to right. get into that. Right. Because people right now want to refinance, they can't because of the values. But I'm just curious, in the case of a refinance, the house can actually have a lot of equity in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And worth much more. Yep. Thirty is three point six two five. Twenty is three and a half, and fifteen is two point eight seven five. Yep. What's the easiest way to get to? Then you have no. Pr it isn't. Well. Then there. Boy, knock on wood, I've been doing this forever, and we don't have any problems. If your ratios are good, your credit is good, I mean, your value is good. What, what would stop you from being able, why would someone not want to take on someone with a great credit history, equity in their home, and a perfect record of paying their payments? Like I don't know, come to me, I'll take you any day. <laughs> I honestly don't know, that doesn't make sense. I mean, no, I don't know who you're dealing with, but that doesn't make sense at all, because we, yeah, because be honest with you, as I mentioned earlier, we have what we call Fannie Mae loans. These are Fannie Mae loans, so it's not as if they're staying in our books. We'll service them, but we sell them. So, an, an FHA? Or VA. We do VA loans as well. But I wouldn't even do that. I mean, if you have all of that. Excuse me? Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought you had to be more qualified to get a VA loan. Right. Well, bankers used to always say the reason why people take VA loans is because it was 100% financing. That's the only reason why people, bankers said um, people took VA loans. It doesn't matter if you have money or not. You don't have to use it. It was 100% financing. So I, d I don't know if anybody, um, hmm, that's strange. Can I just clarify Whoops. a question with you? So, yeah. so if somebody... Charles or any, any one of us wanted to refinance and didn't find that we were getting a good relationship with a bank. The refinancing is the starting fresh from scratch. So you can go to any bank oh, and yeah. start the refinancing. Oh, yeah, process, you right? can. Yeah, and, you, and to try not to pay the appraisal fee up front. You're not supposed to pay it the day of anyway. So try not, because then you can shop around. What the hell do you care? You haven't lost any. There's something wrong there. Yeah, because you, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Also clarify, if, if what I understand what you're saying about the, the difference between fixed and adjustable is that adjustable allows me to play with interest and change the interest without having to go through clothing costs again, appraisal, is that correct? No, the reason why I suggest a, um, an adjustable is because it's fixed for five years. It's usually at at least 1% lower than the others. And most people don't keep the same mortgage for the same length of time. After five years, it goes to what they call one-year adjustable. There is, and I don't want to confuse anybody, there's a 2% review cap each year, and it has a 6% lifetime cap. So that means if I'm starting off at 299, worst possible scenario, year six, I could go to 499. Year seven, I could go to 699. And then year eight, I could go to 899, and then it couldn't 
move up anymore, but then it could go back down again. A lot of people that had adjustables years ago, are, they're in heaven because they didn't have to go through this refinancing. Their rates automatically went down. Well, yeah, well, those were the subprime, no income, no verification loans. We, we've never done those. Those were ridiculous loans, too. Those were people, customers also saying, fibbing on their application, saying that they make $10,000, and we didn't verify it. So it was, excuse me? Right, right, right. Short term, yeah, only for short term, right. So, so when you say you wanted to take advantage of an adjustable to begin with, mm -hmm. knowing it was going to be a low rate, mm -hmm. after five years, can I then go and refinance and do you know, something fixed, yeah. knowing that I'm, I'm committed to the house, or it gave me that window of yes. room to figure out what my plan was? Not only that, that's a portfolio loan. You can refinance at any time. There is no prepayment penalty. So if you wanted to refinance after a year, you could. There's no penalty. But you could also modify and not pay all the expenses of refinancing again. Yeah, you can refinance whenever you want. All banks. I think everybody did away with the prepayment penalties. I'm not sure if there were, um, yeah, go ahead. Right, 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 right. But a lot of, right, exactly. So there's no prepayment penalty, so you could refinance at any time. It's just that it's expensive. You figure to refinance each time, the average refinance, I would say, cost you about $4,000. And that includes attorney fees, title insurance, reco recording, discharging. It includes it all. So it gets to be pretty pricey. Whereas if you do a modification, a modification costs $800. So there's a big difference between $4,000 and Eight hundred, like a smart person would do, go into year four of a five-year arm. At that point, they may want to do a modification, pay eight hundred dollars, get another five years at the going discounted low rate again. But I mean, that's another way of doing it. Yeah. I don't know if I lost track here or not, but you were talking about the uh, appraiser and you got yeah. interrupted, and all, which is just a percussive thing, but there is else, and you got interrupted, and I'm. Oh, I think I was, I started to talk about the HARP program, um, if you could, yeah. The HARP program is a program for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac if your um, equity is, um, if your loan-to-value is greater than 80%. Yeah, other than that, I know it, it's sad. Um, this question is for a friend who owns an S Corp that's shown a loss for the last three years, and she's been trying to refinance. Yeah. No, yeah, because people that are self-employed, they look at their tax returns, they scrutinize their tax returns, um, because that's where a lot of the, the problems came with the, um, the mortgages going bad was with self-employed borrowers. So unfortunately not. They look at that bottom line. The only thing they're going to do is they'll add back depreciation and depletion. Those are the only two things they can add back. Other than that, you're, that's your income. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that was the question, the, the bank looking, we're looking at the, the Yeah, you know, in that case, what I would do, uh, that person has a mortgage now or is looking for a mortgage? But when to refinance? I'm not sure, but I would check with rural housing to see if they would refinance it. Rural housing is in like Amherst, Mass. In rural, like rural, like, rural. Right, like a small town farm, you know, rural. R-U-R-A-L. In your um, in that booklet, it talks about rural housing. They they do 100% financing. They do two types of loans. They'll do a subsidized loan, and then they'll do a, just a, a flat out regular loan. And the subsidized loans is for people who have very very low income. So you may want to check out them. I'm not sure if they'll refinance another bank. I know they do their own, but they. Mass housing, too. There's information about mass housing, a little in there about mass housing. But I, again, I don't know if mass housing, rural housing would do it more probably than the other. Yeah. How about a cosigner? She couldn't find a cosigner? No, I don't think so. No. And she unfortunately bought at the top of the 
Oh, God. Had she gone to the bank to try to get a modification? Um, I don't know. Ask her to go to the bank and get a modification. She doesn't have to prove anything. A modification means that it's changing your existing mortgage. Right now, say your mortgage is at 6% and the current rates are at 3.5. They'll bring that down to the current rate. They'll charge you, some banks will charge you 800, some, to, some banks charge you one point. One point is a percent of whatever your mortgage amount is. But a modification is the easiest way. You don't have to reapply. You don't have to get an appraisal. You don't have to do anything. We have to pay all this no, no, you don't pay anything but a modification fee. And um, not all banks do it, though, but I would definitely check it for her. Which to bank are you with? Berkshire. In which branch? Greg Barrington. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The modification is only for portfolio loans. You got to find out if it's a portfolio loan because there's portfolio loans that are fixed. Those are the ones that are a little bit higher rate that I mentioned earlier. They're four and a half percent. They're not sold. Right, They're right, not right. You can call me and I can find out. Do a modification with a, with a, a loan that got sold no. Service, right, 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 correct, correct. I'm sorry. Whoop. Wait, oh, that's, sorry. You got it. Yes. Somebody I know just did that. He asked me, he picked my brain, and we, we calculated and calculated. It's just extremely difficult to calculate something that's advanced because all equity loans are tied to prime. You know, they're prime minus one and a half. I have no idea what prime's going to be in a year or two or three or four. This is, this is a fixed, um, right, but fixed equity is higher than a first re refinancing for a fixed mortgage because a fixed equity right now is like four and a quarter, four and a half. You can get a 30-year fix at lower than that. The only the difference is, is that the fixed equity, there's no closing cost. Exactly. And if your mortgage is like below 50000 or something, yeah. I just did one for forty five today, it makes sense for them to do a fixed equity. Because he was only saving like $38 a month, and he's prepaying it anyway. Okay. So in that case, it was good for him. There's two different types of home equity loans, too, as we were just mentioning. There's a line of credit, which is like a credit card. You get approved for $50,000. You get charged interest only for the amount you use as you use it. It's a line of credit for 10 years. After 10 years, it goes to principal and interest. It amortizes to principal and interest. So there's that type of loan, and then there's a home equity loan, which what we were just talking about, a fixed home equity loan, um, and that that has principal and interest, pays out in 10, 15, 20 years is the max. There's no closing costs whatsoever with a home equity. There's no appraisal, no title, no nothing. It's really a good deal for a home equity. It's a good way to, I know you probably shouldn't, but it's a good way to pay off some of those credit cards too. You know, get rid of them. Get, some of them are 17, 18%. Get it at, uh, you know, three and a half or 4%. I'm sorry, go ahead. For a home equity loan, um, 10 and 15 year is 4.24. For a 20 year, it's 4.49. And there's no closing cost on that. Then there's the home equity line. Now, for the home equity line, shop around. We honestly don't have the best rate. Everybody's out there with prime minus. We are too, but some banks are instilling what they call floor. We have. We have a floor of 4%. So even though prime minus one and a half is below four, we're not going to um, go below four. Other banks are doing it, so shop around for that because you can get a better deal. Okay, so why don't we take, um, if, if we kind of spread out the Q&A along the way, which is actually great. I think it actually works better because you have the question right there in a moment. It gets answered. Um, but why don't we take another five minutes for you to maybe say what you think is really important and also if anybody has a really burning question, and then what we'll do is we'll just hear from Andrea really quickly, and then that will leave us, you know, 10 minutes for, for all the final questions, of course, if anybody, if you want to linger a little bit longer, I, I think we all would be able to do that. Okay. Okay, so, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is a question for you, Lillian. Okay. With the refinance, the same 32 and 41 percent analysis applies. 
for, for retirement. Oh, yeah. And, and to be honest with you, those are just ratios that we kind of use. I've had ratios up to 48% and 49%. The biggest thing that banks use, and you should know, and you should go in there when you go to a bank, they're called compensating factors. And compensating factors can be a number of things. It could be excellent credit scores. You have excellent credit scores. You have a lot of value, a lot of equity. So your loan to value is very low. Your job, you've been on your job forever. That's a compensating factor. You have low debt to income ratios. That's a huge compensating factor. There's, you've got to sell yourself, you know, because there are some bank employees that just don't know enough. You have to sell yourself. Be prepared to sell yourself. Um, compensating factors mean everything. I mean, I did what, a loan up to 49%, you know, and it was fine. They let it go because of all the compensating factors. So. A refinance or a purchase, you know, in order to get higher ratios. If you want to get higher ratios, we can give them to you if you have, like I just said, excellent credit. It sounds like you, I feel bad for you. About, if, if your loan to ratio is lower than 8%, that is different than if it's higher than 8%. Because if it's higher than 8%, it's, it's not hard. It's just that you're going to have to get what you call private mortgage insurance. There's different things involved if you do a refinance and your loan to value is greater than 80%. Sometimes, and we've done this too, sometimes, most of the time, it's usually if they're an existing customer, we will do, and I don't mean to confuse you, we'll do a first at 80% and then we'll do a second mortgage for that small, you know, couple of percent, maybe 5%, so you can avoid the MI insurance. Okay, okay. So basically, we wrap all that up. <laughs> we get the appraisal in, the appraisal comes in, we review the whole loan. If everything makes sense, we send out the approval letter. The approval letter comes out by what we call remote docs. It goes right to your email address, and we send it to your attorney as well. And then you close when you want. Um, you know, it's up to you and the attorney. You close in the attorney's office. Some of the things I didn't go over is, does everybody know what points are? I know Janet mentioned points. Are you all familiar with points? Points are a percentage, unfortunately, <laughs> but unfortunately, points are a percentage of what your mortgage is. So if I was borrowing $100,000, I could get uh, 3.625 with zero points. If I really wanted to get a lower rate, I could get three point, I could get a quarter percent lower. <laughs> I couldn't think too fast. I could get a quarter percent lower and pay one point. So I could pay $1,000 and buy down my rate a quarter percent. On a purchase, it makes sense because you can deduct that on your income taxes. On a refinance, you have to amortize it over the life of the loan. So if you're getting a 30-year loan, it really doesn't make sense to do that. So I just wanted to quickly go over points. Um, I think that's probably, yeah, you know. I don't know. We work, a lot of us originators work like the brokers 24-7. I have people that call me on a Sunday afternoon and say, what would my monthly payment be? <laughs> and you just give it to them because you know them and you don't care. You're home watching TV anyway. So, but that's it in a nutshell. It's, it's really not as difficult and I feel really bad for you. I'm going to make an example out of you for the next time. So, but that's Thank it. You. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Andrea Harrington. I'm attorney. I'm an attorney at Lausanne, Glover, and Pusilowski here in town. And uh, I just felt so compelled to let people know of just a, some really general information if you're thinking about buying, particularly buying or selling real estate in Berkshire County. And Eve Schatz is an attorney here in town as well. And feel free to just jump in or say anything at all. Um, I'm going to keep this really quick. The, the biggest thing is to use a really good realtor because the purchase and sale, there's a form purchase and sale agreement that's used in Berkshire County in pretty much every 
uh, real estate purchase. A good realtor will help you understand the terms, negotiate the terms. There's a lot of terms to buying a home, uh, and mortgage contingency, inspection contingency, septic contingencies, which is unique to Berkshire County, being a real uh, rural area. Um, you got to have a good realtor to help you through those terms. And the second thing is for the love of all that is good and holy, <laughs> use a local lender, please. Um, so much easier to deal with. Um, there's less documents. They know the area. If something comes up, me or my paralegal, Carolyn Orwick, can pick up the phone and call Lou Ann Harvey and, and try to work through issues. Uh, it's so, so, so important, and I've learned that the hard way. Um, Another thing that I really you know, wanted to explain to people about what an attorney does is with, uh, they do a title search. Um, and they'll check your property that you're con contemplating buying and make sure that you're actually going to own what you think you are purchasing. And that is so important to have an attorney do a good title search for you. And there's, I could talk about that forever, but I, that's all I'll say about that for the time being. And then there is a new Homestead Act that I wanted to make sure that everybody knows about. And I have a piece of paper here that explains what the Homestead Act is. Um, there were changes made to it in March of 2011. Um, it's something that everybody should be aware of. In your deed, it should declare your primary residence as your homestead. And if it's not in your deed, then you can file a declaration of homestead that needs to be recorded at the Register of Deeds. And that will protect your home and the equity in your home from certain kinds of creditors. And so I have a piece of paper about that. If you have any questions, you can ask me about it. It explains it pretty well in what, what I have here. So that's it for me for now. So thank you. And then you. And then you. <laughs> 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 My question is uh, directed to Jen. I'd like to know, does um, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you have to enter into an exclusive right to sell contract with a broker, um, an agency, in order to go in the MLS. Or you won't go in the MLS. can't pay to go on the MLS. No. And the, what happens is now? I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm also a broker in New York and Connecticut, but I pay the MLS there and I put my listings there. I do not know about, I don't do a lot of business over there, so I don't know that if you were just a homeowner and wanted to put your house on that. I will, the, there's a huge benefit to going through a realtor. I mean, because from the MLS, I mean, if you can, I don't think in, I don't think in Berkshire County you can, but the Sandy at the board is amazing. She's awesome. She'll answer any of your questions. And it's right in Pittsfield. But um, they're also, they directly feed Trulia, Zillow, Realtor.com, it all, as of last year, we all now get spider webbed out from the MLS, so we no but longer... But Craigslist does that, too. We all then get spidered out, so... Cra we go to Craig... Our um, MLS goes to Craigslist, too. Right, you can do Craigslist and spider out without going on MLS. Sure, I mean, it, absolutely. You can definitely market and sell your own home if that's all you have to do. It's well, a lot of work. Is right now, and the fact that the home value you're not getting an appraiser's about company. Yeah, so Craigslist limits home. you to four photographs, so try to set up something with someone else where you can add more photos. Oh, yeah. And, and we should get two appraisals because there is a huge difference between one versus the other. So I would get two. Unless they've got great comps, unless the comps seem like, because we have been having a lot of problems with appraisals. A lot. Process from purchase to sale. Well, yeah, I, I'd like to go with the filter, but I can't with the feed. I Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, who's next there in the back? Um, yes, I just wanted to ask um, you know, if you get your name, sorry. Andrea. Andrea. Um, what changed when, when uh, in 2011 with the homestead? 
so now um, you everybody automatically has some protection in the equity in their home, like if you're sued. So you automatically have up to $125,000 of protection without declaring the homestead. Now, if you declare your primary residence as your homestead, you also get added protection up to $500,000 in equity. And what changed, I think, is that it increased the amount of the protection. And that uh, protection will also so, so you're protected from certain kinds of creditors. Um, it doesn't protect you from any kinds of tax liens or from um, like child support or spousal support. Um, that your home's equity can be accessed for those kinds of debts. Um, any kind of court judgment where you've been found to have committed fraud. Um, and the protection can also extend to a spouse as well under the new Homestead Act. And Eve might be a little bit more familiar with how that Homestead Act was before the change, but I know with the change, like, that's what it offers. So if I, if I signed a form several years ago for the Homestead Act, whatever, so I can now redo it? No, if it's already named as your homestead, you're all set. Even an older form? Yes. Older yes. Yes. And where do you find that in your in your actual mortgage statement? It's on in your deed. Deed. The deed to your home. My my question on here too is about the Homestead Act. Um, because it go it, it's on the primary deed it won't um, refinancing wouldn't affect it because it's it's says on the primary deed. But that's what I yes. need to check because I did do the homestead act years ago, but it didn't know how to check to make sure that was. Yeah, right. if um, your deed, well, your deed should be recorded with the register of mm -hmm. deeds, which, if you live in South County, is right here in Great Barrington, and you can go online and you can look at your deed, mm -hmm. and you can see that it's that it's in so there. It's there. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to Mass Land Records. Yeah. Yeah. Masslandrecords.com. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Great. largest drop we had was in 08 and it went 13 percent and it's, <coughs> it's just been coming up since um, slowly but so that's, it wasn't that, that good bargain thing like that. no I mean there still are just because like my mom said the uh, there's a we never had you know foreclosures the way we've had them in short sales the way we've had them now so that's sort of so that's what you would have to go for so if you're looking for a, a really good deal or I mean, honestly, and you see this differently when you're working with a buyer versus a seller, but you never know what position a seller is in. You know, I have conversations with my sellers all the time. They're like, well, why I want to keep the price the way it is, but I'll, you know, I'll negotiate. And, you know, you laugh because you're like, why don't we just lower the price? But I don't want to lower the price. But, you know, they'll negotiate a, a significant amount. So, you know, it's sometimes it's tough to get an actual buyer, you know, who's qualified to, to put pen to paper and to make the offer because they feel it might be offensive or, you know, but it's, you know, it's a good time to do that to make offers on things because there are we are making deals. It was a very busy, busy summer. So, I mean, and they can get 
they're not going for fatality jobs. But you have this Warren Buffett who is treatment for secondary, has a high, faces a higher tax rate than he himself. Okay? And that's quite common with a lot of the people into one person. But again, it's simply because the current system allows them to do that. So this is a policy issue, but uh, unfortunately this is one area that is very highly political. Like you have these stop one person, many of them are probably funding the campaign. So whether the incoming government will actually act upon it or not, that's very hard to say. But obviously it does have an impact. I mean, the US has the highest level of inequality among developed nations. And that's a little shocking, but that it's simply because of this particular reason. And this is a fundamental reason that leads to that high inequality level. The per capita income of the Americans are not that high as the world that people should have fun. It's not very high enough. That's an indication of that. Why the like the largest economy in the world would have that kind of a look at it. Any other research on how it could, could change? There is existing research, but the initiative has to come in from a very tough government. So um, there is is it public knowledge or is it not the public knowledge in what which one? Which one specifically? Would it be public knowledge let's say the percentage of Income that is being taxed and how that could be leveraged for debt. Um, I mean, I, I, well, any, anything that's recorded through the IRS, the, the federal government should have access to it. But the problem is a lot of it's not being recorded because they deliberately keep their money outside the country. Uh, the no. moment that they bring the money in the country, they will be facing the tax rates, which is, and like for the larger companies, they'll be facing tax rates of 35% at the federal level. So they want to avoid that. It's better to keep the money in Ireland where you pay 12.5%. Once the, if the money is in Ireland, it's not reported in the United States. Uh, not, not in all conditions. You know what, I'm just gonna, because I just get two other questions and I'm so committed to our ending on time. So if anybody can get ready to go. Mm -hmm. I would like to know though. That's on purpose. <laughs> and that's on purpose. So we have Amelia and then Lynette. And then Lynette. And if you take the time, if you're in a rush to get out of the door, to just fill out that little survey right now, that might be a convenient way of saving yourself a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I will say is, well, why don't we take those last questions and then I'll just talk okay. about them. Okay. This is for the land. Uh, you mentioned the Homestead Act. Is that? No, I didn't. Oh. You, I'm sorry, yes, you did. Um, does that cover New York State as well? I am licensed in Massachusetts. I'm not qualified to give any legal advice uh, regarding New York State, so okay, I so can't you answer know that. Whether it's covering New York State. Um, or it's federal? No, this is, federal this, is a state, this is a state law, okay. but I can only talk about Massachusetts. That's fine. I might be oversimplifying it, but reverse mortgage, yes or no? I think it's a lawyer's question. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know that it's a lawyer's question. <laughs> yeah. I don't do too many of them. Banks uh, do do them? Oh, yeah, we do them. We do. We have a, a young lady who specializes in reverse mortgages. The fees are outrageous. I mean, I honestly, I want to leave my property to my kids. <laughs> and I, wa I don't want it to be too you know, too cumbersome with a huge mortgage on it. So, I mean, if it's your only needs of income, it's a great alternative. It really is. Um, and I can hook you up with somebody who knows the ins and outs and has been doing them for years. I just, I don't agree with them. And also, just to add to that, there is, <clears throat> there's a couple of really good federal government websites. There's the new Consumer Protection Bureau. They do a whole piece on reverse mortgages and what to look for, what to know about before you start even talking to a lender. And it's very clearly well written, 
it's great information and it's really like a self-education process. And we'll send out the link with some of our, I don't have it on, I don't know what it is, but if you look up Consumer Protection Association, it'll, it'll, it'll come up. It's well, a great site, there's some with, great information. And with that, all the banks make you go through counseling if you do do it, because they want to make sure. So all the banks right. do make sure you go counseling. Counseling with? For the, to learn all about the reverse mortgages. You can't take one unless they've counseled you. That usually is a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this this requires counseling. Well, maybe you shouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. But everybody's different, so. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So first, I just want to thank all of our presenters for the generosity of our time. And and again, I just want to welcome us back to this, this community of women. We are the women who live in this local region, and more of us will be coming uh, on board as we gather momentum for next month and again once a month coming together. And I think one of the most uh, beautiful things that has emerged out of the first round that we had last semester was a lot of, uh, of us expressing how uh, as positive it was just to come together and take on these issues, but as a larger group, to be together and to hear each other's different questions. You know, you're hearing people ask questions you might not think to ask, and that helps us reveal getting more information and also to take it on in kind of a short, sweet way. And of course, to have great people in our area and also around who are consistently inspired to come and share the wealth of their knowledge and expertise uh, to empower us, just out of the principle of, isn't that great? Like, get people, especially women in your area, empowered to uh, do the best that they can, right? So, because a lot of stuff comes from us in the So, uh, rock on, and hope to see all of you next month. And have the email if you have any questions or uh, anything that comes up or you want to invite friends to participate, you just email the Women's Financial Empowerment and we'll respond or get you on the list or all that kind of